shares this following story in a sermon that he preached. In the fall of the year, Linda, a young woman, was traveling up the rutted and rugged highway from Alberta to Yukon. Not Yukon, Connecticut but Yukon with a Y way up in Canada. Linda didn't know. You don't travel to Whitehorse alone in a rundown Honda Civic. So she set off where only four-wheel drives and professional drivers normally venture. The first evening, she found a room in the mountains near a summit. She asked for a 5 a.m. wake-up call so she could get an early start. She couldn't understand why the clerk looked so surprised at her request. But as she awoke to the early morning fog shrouding the mountaintops, now she understood. Not wanting to look foolish, she got up and went to breakfast. Two truckers invited Linda to join them since the place was so small, she felt obliged. Where are you headed? One of the truckers asked. White horse, she said. In that little civic? No way. This pass is dangerous in weather like this. Well, I'm determined to try, was Linda's gutsy, if not very uninformed response. then I guess we're just going to have to hug you. Linda drew back. There's no way I'm going to let you touch me. No, no, not like that, the truckers laughed. We'll put one truck in front of you and one in the rear. That way, you'll get through the mountains. All that foggy morning, Linda followed the two red dots in front of her, had the reassurance of a big escort in front and behind as they made it safely through the mountains. Caught in the fog, In our dangerous passage through life, we need fellow Christians who know the way and can safely lead us, and others that can go behind gently encouraging us as we pass safely on our way. This is our third message in the Discipleship 101 series, and we've seen that New Testament believers have a pattern to follow. Once they accept Jesus as Savior, we saw that, first of all, they should get baptized, professing and illustrating their salvation to everyone. Then we saw that they need to persist obstinately in four things, and last week we saw the first thing that they need to have a tenacious grip on and a hunger for is the disciples' doctrine. This morning, we're going to move to the next item on the list, which is fellowship. Let's look at that verse again. They continued steadfastly. 
persisted obstinately in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Fellowship is the association of believers in the experience of their common salvation or in the various consequences, expressions, and benefits of salvation. If you want to make it simple, fellowship is both sharing something in common and a partnership. So I, th I want you to think about this. That day on Pentecost, we had a group of 120 people. They gave the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell, Peter preached, power of God. 3,000 people in one day, they got saved. They were baptized. But it didn't stop there. Now, by the way, These folks, they received the word, they were baptized. Now we had 3,120 people from that one day that were not just at that one service, but now they were persisting in hearing doctrine every time they could and in fellowship. In other words, these guys didn't come just to be entertained. They didn't come just to hear doctrine. They came to share. They came to have things in common. They came to bond as a unit. They came to partner in their membership at the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. Now that's powerful. Today, we're going to see some of the things that these folks shared in. Remember, they didn't only continue or persist obstinately in doctrine, they persisted obstinately in sharing. Sharing what? Well, they shared in the salvation experience. We heard a testimony today about finding someone, in, you know, someone working, and then in the workday world you found someone that was saved that you get to work with, and all of a sudden, even though you don't go to the same church, even though you don't know the same, the same circles, there is something there. There is a fellowship there. Why? Because we both have been saved by the same Savior. We both recognize that we were condemned by the same sin, washed by the same blood, believe the same Bible, filled with the same spirit, share in a common salvation experience. John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6. We say we have fellowship with him. When we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jude, and verse 3, uses an interesting, interesting term. Beloved, 
when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. You know what? We're different from each other. But if we're saved, we've, we all join fellowship in a common salvation. We may have been saved differently, saved at different ages. Some saved when they were little kids. Some saved after they were adults. But all saved the same way. I'm in trouble. I can't save myself. Jesus paid that price. I asked him to save me. He did. The Holy Spirit came and lived inside. Now, I can have fellowship, share with some of you. Hopefully share with all of you. Even though we may not have the same tastes. We may not have the same culture. We may not have the same background. We may not have the same uh, political ideation, although you should listen to me. But we have the common salvation. Could you imagine what it was like? Now you have a 120 people, I would guess, those people had been pretty close because they had been, you know, growing while the ministry of Jesus was happening. Now, could you imagine the influx? Now, remember, the First Baptist Church in Jerusalem was instantly international. Can somebody tell me why? Because all the different languages, you had 14 different languages preached on, in Pentecost and those 3,000 people that got, got saved and joined the church, all different backgrounds, all different cultures, well, you talk about an instant culture change to a church. You had 120 people kind of knew each other. All of a sudden, it grows from 120 to 3,000. And now you've got a lot of people, I don't know, I'm not sure I like that. I like a small church. I kind of prefer a small church. And small churches are kind of, this is what makes me comfortable. This is way too big. But what does the Bible say? They didn't complain. You know, I want to just ask for it no more. I was okay with that. You didn't hear the disciples saying, I think it was good when it was just 11 of us. Because all of a sudden now, the 3,000 people, folks they didn't know, folks whose parents they didn't know, folks whose background they didn't know, folks whose culture they didn't even know, some Greek folks coming in, some Hellenistic Jews coming in, and yet they say, but guess what? You got saved the same way I got saved. You got filled with the same spirit I got filled with. You believe the same Bible I believe. And so all of a sudden, they persisted obstinately in fellowship. I need more. I need more. I don't know these folks. These folks are weird. But that's okay because we have the same salvation. See, there's something about it. When you get saved, you share in a common salvation. You share in a love experience. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation or payment for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And so now this brand new assembly, drawn together by a common salvation, see that they're drawn together by a similar love. Now, how does that work? 
again, different backgrounds, maybe even different political views. And now those different political views, they didn't vote on, they killed each other over. They had Hellenistic Jews, and regular Jews, they had all these things. Yet, bam, one day, 3,000 people joined the church. And the Bible says then, daily, the church was added, such as should be saved. And in chapter 4, bam, another 5,000 people joined the church. So you see, church is growing like crazy. Lots of strangers now. Yet, they kept coming. They wanted to be together. They could, and the Bible says that they were meeting every day. Why? They couldn't get enough of the Apostles' Doctrine. They couldn't get enough of the fellowship because we have something in common. And guess what? Not only do we have this common salvation, but we all know for the first time what it's really like to be loved for God so loved the world. And I realize I've never been loved before like I've been loved now. And now the Bible says that will be recognized by our love for each other. And so there's this innate, organic love for the other believers that have experienced that same common salvation, now experience that same love. And we're bound together. I don't know why I'm bound together. These guys are strangers, but we're bound together. as we And as we learn the same doctrine, we're not strangers anymore. As we break bread together, we're not strangers anymore. As we pray together and share our hearts together, we're not strangers anymore, and we can't get enough of it. You wonder, what made the church at Jerusalem grow so fast? Part of it was, this is the way God intended it, no doubt. But the other part is because folks had the right appetites. I want doctrine. I want fellowship. I want to be around other believers. I want to share the love experience. And then guess what? They shared the worship experience. As they came together, they were praising the Lord together. As they came together, they worshiped together. And the Old Testament knows a little bit about that. David talks about this. We took sweet counsel together. We walked and walked into the house of God in company. Psalm 42 and verse 4, when I remember these things, I pour my soul, pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept the holy day. Man, there was something about getting a bunch of folks together and fellowshipping in love and fellowshipping in the common salvation and fellowshipping in worship. I want to tell you something. Um, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm, I'm old school. I love the old hymns. I don't know the new stuff. But when I went to, um, I can learn. I'm awful good at learning. Maybe not good at learning English, but anyway. So we went to the Yeti concert, you know, um, Emmanuel Baptist Church. place was packed. Goodness, I, I want to believe that there was 1,500, maybe 2,000 people there. place was packed. And uh, we started by singing hymns we all recognize. I like that. But let me tell you something. There's something that will get your goose bump, chill bump machine moving. But having, yes, the full orchestration, piano and, and guitar and fiddles and, and all these things, right? But then... All the voices, everybody standing. We're going to praise the Lord. And at the top of our lungs, we're singing the old hymns of the faith. Man, what is that? 
fellowship and worship. You look and you see all through the Old Testament how much the Bible calls attention to singing in the congregation. These folks couldn't wait together and wait to get together to fellowship, to share something in common. And you know what? When we sing, we're helping each other. The Bible says, speaking unto yourselves, plural, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We help each other. So you say, I'm no good at singing. Hey, listen, the very fact that you sing from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, from the bottom of your soul, you're, you're worshiping God with all your might, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and you start doing that, and that, and that light coming out of you starts to illuminate others who then start to illuminate others. That's how it works. That's the fellowship of worship. And these folks couldn't wait to get together to fellowship, to share, to partner in worship. They also would fellowship share in needs and blessings. The Apostle Paul had to kind of redirect uh, the church at Corinth on this. There'd be no schism or split in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. One member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. That is partnership. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. But to do good and communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Paul said, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive, to share the needs, to share the physical needs. That was part of Paul's discipleship rehabilitation program. We, we know that he spent three years in Ephesus as their pastor. And he says, let him that stole steal no more. Okay, so what do they do? But rather let him labor, working with his hands, so he can have all the money he ever will need. That's not what it says, is it? Working with his hand, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. The local church, when they started fellowshipping, yes, they were fellowshipping in the common salvation, they were fellowshipping in the common love, and they were fellowshipping in common worship, but they were also fellowshipping in common needs. If I have something and you need something, I'll give to you. But you may have something that I need and you give to me. And so there was a, a sensitivity, a meeting of needs. And that was immediate. And you know what? You want to grow a group of folks, have a spirit wrought sensitivity to meeting needs. Somebody comes in with a need, and you have three or four or five people aware enough to see that need and go try to meet it right away. Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Galatians, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We have a fellowship in meeting 
common needs. The documentary, uh, March of the Penguins. Anybody ever seen that, by the way? Okay. Follows the emperor penguins of Antarctica on their incredible journey through the ice and snow to mating grounds up uh, to Seventy Mile Island. Narrated by Morgan Freeman, this beautiful film captures the drama of these three foot high birds in the most inhospitable of environments. Once the males have reached the breeding grounds and have been given the responsibility for the eggs, they override their competitive nature to form a team for the sake of survival. A massive storm sets in. Vicious wind pelts the penguins. They now, thousands of them, huddle in a mass. As the view alternates from close-ups of the <coughs> ice-caked penguins to the panoramic shots of the huddled throng, Freeman narrates, as the fathers settle in their long wait in a breeding ground, the temperature is 80 below zero without taking into account of the wind, which can blow 100 miles an hour. Though they can be aggressive during the rest of the year, at this time the males are docile, united as a team. They brace against the storm, merging in their thousands of bodies into a single mass, but constantly moving a little. You know what they're doing? Each will take a turn, getting a little time to spend in the middle of the huddle with all the warm bodies around, and then come out to bear the brunt for the others, and then come back in to get warm again. All of these massive birds working as one to make sure everybody is protected. That is fellowship. And the new believers at Jerusalem instantly got into fellowship. You know what? The church at Jerusalem didn't grow because they had a great screen, although we like good screens. Or a slick advertising, although we like slick advertising. Or a good website. It grew because there was something supernatural happening. They shared strength. Th strength for restoration. You know, as we're in the battle, there, there are some folks that get down. There are some folks that need to be restored, and part of the fellowship is pulling the other people up. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be also tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, like those penguins, restoring strengthening strengthen ye the weak hands confirm the feeble knees knees say to them that are of a fearful heart be strong fear not behold your God will come with a vengeance even God with a recompense and he will save you every once in a while we can see within our fellowship someone needs to be helped someone needs to be strengthened someone needs to be hey listen be strong. God's coming. Be strong. God see you. Be strong. I'm with you. Encourage. The verses that we have that say that we need to be in church 
don't say, you need to be in church because you need preaching, although we do, amen? Doesn't say we need to be in church because we need to learn a bunch of stuff, although we do. Doesn't say you need to be in church because you need to worship together, although we do. This verse, about there are these two verses about not forsaking the assembling or coming together as a church is about encouragement. Look at this. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as they see the day approaching. So they continued in fellowship. They were partnering. They were, they were sharing in the burden to encourage each other. In his book, Rediscovering Church, Bill Hybels tells of a message of, by uh, Dr. Gilbert Ligestan. He said the only kind of fellowship many know in church is after service when man, men stand around and ask superficial questions. And then they find their wives having the same conversation and yell at them for taking too long. And they go home. Biblical fellowship has the power to revolutionize our lives. Masks come off. Conversation gets deep. Hearts get vulnerable. Lives get shared. Accountability is invited and tenderness flows. People really do become brothers and sisters. The New Testament believers left us a pattern for discipleship. We need to develop a ravenous appetite for fellowship. Sharing with our brothers and sisters in Christ, that is discipleship 101. Every head bowed.